Jesus' passion, arrested, sentenced to death, crucified, is retold through readings in Christian services during Holy Week. Tragically, over the centuries, these retellings have pitted Christians against Jews and have even led to murderous violence. Such sinful consequences are contrary to the good news of Christ. In this video series, members of the Christian Scholars Group on Christian-Jewish Relations, along with two expert Jewish colleagues, explore four scenes in the Passion story. Basing their discussions on decades of research, they consider how Jesus' passion can be presented in fresh ways that repudiate anti-Jewish biases and underscore the gospel message. This task is a sacred obligation. In this segment, we explore the image of the crucifixion. Hello. Today, with my colleagues in the Christian Scholars Group, Elena Procario Foley of Iona College in New Rochelle, New York, and John Polakowski of the Catholic Theological Union in Chicago, Illinois, and I, Mary Boys of the Union Theological Seminary in New York City, we wish to do this video that focuses on the crucifixion of Jesus. And we aim to call attention to three interrelated layers of the passion stories in the hopes of enlarging our own understanding of these stories, but also of helping to heal our relationship with Jews and the Jewish people. So in these interrelated layers, we are looking at the historical context that is the crucifixion in Roman rule Judea. We are looking at the justice layer, as it were. That is the call in our time to correct misinterpretations of the passion and death of Jesus that have blamed Jews. And the theological and the spiritual context, that is the passion and death of Jesus in relation to Jesus's ministry and what that calls us to. So first then, a word about the historical layer. In the time of Jesus, Rome ruled the land. By the 20s of the first century of the common era, Rome was the superpower of the West. It encompassed 60 to 70 million people. Its lands extended from the Nile River to the English Channel from Jerusalem to Lisbon. And Rome enacted its foreign policy by means of fear and awe, by means of dominating the many peoples it ruled. And so what greater mechanism to inspire fear and to keep order among the people than a punishment and a torture such as crucifixion? It was a public humiliation, a naked body hanging for hours, if not days. More than that, it was the ultimate deterrent against uprisings. For who would dare challenge those in power who had the power to crucify dissidents? Tens of thousands of Jews, in fact, suffered death by crucifixion under the years of Roman rule. But for reasons we can only speculate, the gospels gloss over Rome's use of crucifixion to preserve its grip on the populace. They rightly portray Pontius Pilate, the Roman appointed governor of Judea from 26 to 36 as the one who had the ultimate authority but strangely, they blame a vociferous Jewish mob who seemingly held 
the hapless Pilate under their sway. And we, we can see this particularly in the Gospel of John and think of chapters 18 and 19 in particular, and the verse 19, 5, crucify him, crucify him. Of course, the church knows that the gospels were not intended as historical documents. They are theological interpretations of the significance of Jesus of Nazareth. So in this instance, we need to look to history because that reveals, for instance, that the Judean Jews did not hold the power of capital punishment under Roman control. From the perspective of history, those who ruled in the name of Rome, such as Pontius Pilate, held the responsibility for the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, it could be that a few Jewish authorities who were relatively powerless under Rome's control, nevertheless cooperated in some manner with Pilate and his henchmen. To blame the Jews, however, is both a historical error and a tragic theological error in a church that came to accuse the Jews as a people of being Christ killers. Just to step back for a moment. From this historical context, we can infer that the crowds that Jesus drew and the values and the beliefs that he preached about the kingdom of God threatened Romans cruel, Rome's cruel domination of its peoples. In this very real sense, we can say that crucifixion was a con consequence of Jesus's challenge to the injustices of his day. But before we move to this theological interpretation, let us first look to how artists have portrayed, imaged, and imaged the crucifixion, emphasizing the culpability of Jews. And so now Elena will show us two images from the history of art that exemplify some of the problems that we are talking about in this video. So Elena, I hand this over to you. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, putting all of that in historical context is, is so important for us. Accusing the Jews in all places and at all times for the death of Jesus of Nazareth is one of the church's most tragic errors. This Christ killer charge also known as deicide, the killing of God, has led to countless acts of injustice, often violent acts against Jews and Jewish communities. Accusing all Jews for Jesus's crucifixion paints over the actual historical context of the Roman occupation as you have explained, and it's a terrible injustice. It also ignores and dismisses the very distinct lives and spiritualities of different Jewish communities at the time of Jesus and throughout history. Now, over the centuries, Christian art has very effectively painted a negative theology that places all blame for the death of Jesus at the feet of Jews. So as this image comes up on your screen, let's look at this German copper engraving from 1482 by an artist known as Meister H.W. Let's see how he imagines the crucifixion. In this image, the presence of Roman soldiers is really quite muted. You can see one soldier on a horse in the foreground on the bottom right, but all the other men in the crowd are identified as Jews by their beards and by their head coverings that are traditionally used in Christian art to identify Jews. If you look on the far left, you will see a Jew lifting up a wine-soaked sponge to Jesus, while other Jews appear to be holding spears. Now in the gospels, these are traditionally actions attributed to Roman soldiers. Instead of Roman guards carrying out a crucifixion the true historical context of Jesus's death, 
the artist depicts a largely Jewish crowd rushing the cross from all sides. Most of the people leer in satisfaction. The image literally teaches the scene in John 19.5 that Mary referenced. A mob shouting angrily, crucify him, crucify him. The obvious message is that the Jews killed Jesus. Also, do you notice how the artist dehumanizes the Jews by giving many of them exaggerated facial features and crafting their mouths, noses, and eyes to look like apes? Such visual details contribute to setting up Jews for vilification as Christ killers. We have a sacred obligation to repent for how we Christians have treated Jews, and we must denounce, renounce, and reform anti-Jewish theologies. This would be an act of justice. There is nothing in this image that makes the viewer think that Jesus is crucified as an observant Jew of his time, or that most of his followers were Jewish. Would anything in this engraving prompt Christians to reflect on what the Jewish roots of Christianity might mean for our own spirituality? Does it help us as Christians to reflect on our own sin and responsibility for the death of Christ? In a few moments, John will take up these spiritual and theological questions more deeply. But first, let's take a second image, this time from the 20th century. It vividly illustrates how centuries of indiscriminately blaming the Jews for the death of Jesus contributes to one of humankind's worst atrocities, the Holocaust. This is the cover of a Nazi propaganda pamphlet distributed in German-occupied Poland in 1943. The title of the pamphlet translates as Mortal Enemy of Christianity. Here we can see an inhumanly large Jewish man caricatured as a monster looming over a burning city and the broken cross of Jesus. For me, this poster wants to send the message that since the death of Jesus, Jews are responsible for all manner of evil in the world and need to be eliminated. The Nazis' final solution. As we Christians enter the seasons of Lent and Easter, we need to think about the profound changes in Christian teaching about Jews and Judaism since the Holocaust. Increasingly, Christians are coming to the awareness that Christian interpretations of the gospel concerning Jews and the crucifixion of Jesus have caused immeasurable harm to real Jews. Traditionally, the week between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday have been the most dangerous week of the year for Jews. Many Christian denominations have issued public statements repenting of their Christian anti-Semitism. Instead of falsely accusing all Jews throughout history for killing Christ and ignoring the historical context of Roman rule, we Christians are now encouraged to learn from our elder sibling in faith. How might we understand the close ties that spiritually connect us? And how might that change our Lenten practice? How does reflecting on the death of Jesus as a practicing Jew of his time change our understanding of the week between Palm Sunday and Easter Sunday? John, I'm eager to hear from you on these theological and spiritual questions. Thank you very much, Elena. Both you and Mary in your presentations have certainly vividly presented the um, impact of the centuries of distortion uh, in the church for the responsibility for uh, the death of Christ on Calvary. I'd like to focus right now on two important theological aspects of the events on Calvary. The first is also a theological distortion. It's been rather commonplace to present the story of Calvary during Holy Week as a kind of isolated three days, disconnect, totally disconnected from Jesus's public ministry. That kind of presentation, for example, was apparent in Mel Gibson's um, rather well-known movie, the Passion of the Christ. But that is not what the New Testament 
says about Jesus's ultimate death. It places Jesus's ultimate death as the culmination point of his three years of public ministry. Three years in which he told us how to attain salvation. We attain salvation through his modeling of the Beatitudes. He, we achieve salvation by following his example of concern for the marginalized, of compassion for those who are mourning or those who are ill. He, throughout his ministry, proclaimed the absolute dignity of every human person who came in his presence. We need to do the same. We need the celebrate commemoration of Holy Week to be an instrument that will strengthen our commitment along the lines that Jesus modeled for us. Jesus did not simply save us by spilling his blood. Yes, he did spill his blood, but the spilling of the blood was the, directly the result of his ministry for human dignity and, and justice um, to the people who were living under tremendous political oppression at the time. And in so doing, he threatened the continuing, continuing power uh, and authority of the ruling class over the, these people. And so they decided to put him to death. But we should never separate spiritually and historically the events of Calvary from the three years of public ministry. Those three years present us with an understanding of Jesus' um, appreciation of what human redemption entails. The second theological aspect of the events of Calvary has to do with the understanding in Christian spirituality of who killed Christ. There is a long-standing tradition in the Christian community that it was our sins, not the sins of the Jewish mob or anyone else, but it was our sins who played a major role in putting Christ to death on Calvary. Actually, many uh, celebrate commemorations of Holy Week do have an echo of that tradition because it is rather commonplace in Christian churches on Good Friday to sing the hymn, Were You There When They Crucified Our Lord? We must connect the events of Calvary with the events in our lives, particularly the sinful expressions in our lives that uh, have contributed and continue to contribute to the suffering and death of Jesus. That must be our understanding of the spirituality involved with Calvary. There is a real challenge today as we celebrate Holy Week in the reading in many congregations of the Passion of the Christ from the New Testament on Palm Sunday and on Good Friday. Frequently, the congregation is asked to uh, publicly take the part of the supposed mob that crawled, called for the crucifixion of Jesus. They are instructed to shout out, crucify him, crucify him. That kind of action uh, can, if it is not properly understood, lead to um, an intensification of the old stereotype of Jesus's responsibility for the death of Christ. It is the responsibility of pastoral le leaders to make sure that when they invite the congregation to participate in the reading of the Passion, 
The congregation that shouts out crucify is so doing because of their own sinfulness, not as though they were acting in the place of a Jewish mob who called for Jesus' execution. Otherwise, the practice of people's participation in the liturgical celebration of Holy Week may lead to intensification of anti-Semitism today. And we know how challenging the resurgence of traditional anti-Semitism has become in human society today. So my friends, the commemoration of Holy Week has a theological and spiritual meaning. It is not just a historical event. It is, should be a time when we recommit ourselves to the model for human life that Jesus presented us in his Beatitudes and his many other actions during his public ministry. Those activities are not accidental they are not just a sideshow. They were an integral part of his redemptive action, which culminated in his suffering and death on the cross. So let us then continue to make the events of Calvary a central challenge for our response to Jesus and to the teachings that he presented us during his public ministry. Thanks, John. Thanks, Elena. And thanks Thank to all of you for watching. Our brief video is really a challenge to all Christians to recognize that the events of the passion and death of Jesus have been erroneously blamed on Jews, but more than just correcting an error, our video is an invitation to enlarge our understanding of the crucifixion and to incorporate the historical background. And most of all, to press home the layers of justice and of spirituality that lead to us accepting the fact that we are called to accept the cross of Jesus that by understanding the crucifixion of Jesus as a consequence of challenging the injustices of his day, that we recognize the profundity of our own call to take up our cross and to follow Jesus. So again, our thanks for watching and my thanks to my friends, Elena and John.